All right. Um, so I think we can go ahead and get things started. The, uh, the joins have started to, to stabilize a little bit. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us for today's uh, webinar on NFT basics, the legal implications of NFTs that you can't ignore. Um, please feel free, uh, all the attendees, to put your questions into the uh, chat box or into the Q&A um, at the end of the presentation. Um, or if any of these questions happen to, to relate directly to a topic under discussion, um, I'll start throwing some of these things at uh, Moish and Max to, to give us their, uh, their advice. Um, so I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce my friend and colleague, Max Dillendorf. Uh, Max's practice is focused primarily on digital assets, cryptocurrency, and technologies that drive blockchain and related distributive computed, computing networks. Um, an early adopter of virtual currency and its associated legal, financial, and business implications, Max is considered the go-to expert for anything crypto related. Having gained valuable experience in all aspects of crypto assets, Max is also a top forensic Bitcoin and crypto expert witness. Um, his expertise has also made him one of the top cryptocurrency consultants for Fortune 500 companies. Very excited to have Max with us on this uh, webinar today. Thank you, Max. Thank you so much, Kim. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, and then Moish Peltz, uh, another friend of mine who I've known for many years and my partner at Falcon Rapport and Berkman PLLC, uh, where he chairs the firm's intellectual property practice group. Moish has been advising cryptocurrency businesses since 2014. Uh, he began his career at an intellectual property law boutique with a focus on trademark matters and federal litigation. Uh, his primary focus of late has been the intersection of intellectual property and cryptocurrency in the form of the day's webinar topic particularly NFTs. Thank you, Ken, for the introduction. Max, uh, glad, glad we could uh, put this all together. I'm gonna take down the uh, disclaimer warning. And I think you know, one thing we wanted to do is kind of gauge uh, where people are on this webinar. Max and I have been uh, talking back and forth, I think over the past month at this point about all of the implications rising out of NFTs, me kind of focusing more from the uh, intellectual property and, and uh, entertainment arts side, and, and Max perhaps more from the, the regulatory and risk management side. But I think we, there's a lot of overlap and intersection and we've been calling each other uh, sometimes late into the night talking about some of these things. Uh, so, so thanks Max for being here. Thank you, Moish. So, so I'm gonna launch a poll real quick. I, I just wanna take the temperature of, the, of, of, my, my, of my, my gut reaction versus what people respond. All right, so first poll is, have you bought cryptocurrency? Let's keep it basic. It's interesting, it's about, we're settling in at about 60, 40, yes, no. So 60% of the audience has bought cryptocurrency, about 40% no, um, which is interesting because I think the, the concept of NFTs really relies upon, if you wanna understand what's happening behind the curtains, I think you have to understand blockchain and cryptocurrency and how that works. And I think the, the, the most obvious way to do that would be to purchase cryptocurrency. So if, if, if you're come away from this conversation um, wanting to learn more, I think that might be a good place to start and then work your way up to NFTs. Because most of the NFTs, except for NBA Top Shot, for example, you're, you might need to purchase using cryptocurrency. So that's how they start. So we're gonna end that poll. And then we have one more poll. Max, any, any comment on that? Is that what you expected? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's about right. Okay, so this question is, have you actually purchased an NFT? So no or yes, or you've even gone and minted one yourself. It's multiple choice, so pick as many as you feel are applicable. Marsh, what about you? Did you uh, have you ever minted one? I have. I um, I actually the the article that I wrote uh, last week about uh, intellectual property and NFTs. I actually turned that blog post into an NFT, which, as far as I know, is the first legal blog post NFT. But I would love for someone to prove me wrong. Moish, I actually this morning I issued Moish coin and uh, it's, 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 it's already traded on multiple exchanges. So 
<laughs> I, I want to get in on the on the ground floor. And if someone makes me a really compelling offer, I would consider selling my my IP NFT to them. Um, yeah, actually, your your profile may be already on on Bit BitCloud. Did you check? I did not. <laughs> well, you should. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So looking at the results, um, looks like about twenty percent are saying no and and don't really know what's going on. Uh, about half the audience is saying no, but they want to either buy or mint something. Uh, part of those people might be like me that they've logged into NBA Top Shot and tried to buy it, but have been, you know, number like 300,000 in line. So, um, and then about, you know, 13% have either bought uh, or, or minted an NFT. So it's, it's interesting data that we got there. So I think we could jump right into the, the very first question, just for people who are really new to this topic, which is what is an NFT? So Max, do you want to take that or you want me to? Go ahead, take a step. So yeah, I, I, the simplest way I think is, is to conceptualize it as a digital collectible, right? It's, it's on the blockchain and it's something that it, it's, it's proof of ownership. You, you can prove that you own the NFT. So in terms of collectibles, you can analogize to something like a basketball card, right? Um, a physical basketball card, you, you can buy it, you can hold it in your hand, you, you have it at home and you can sell it. So if you buy a rookie Michael Jordan card uh, for a dollar as part of the larger pack, you can then, uh, if it appreciates in value, you can sell it. So same thing with NFTs, they're, they're proof of ownership of the NFT itself. Now, the, 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 whole, the whole concept of the NFTs being a little bit different though, is that they reside on the blockchain and they can re represent not just collectibles like uh, basketball cards, but they can they're, they're really tokens for things they, they could be any, anything for, for real estate, for financial transactions. So the implications here are pretty serious and we'll, we'll get into that um, later in the conversation. But the, the, the word itself, non-fungible token, is, is the, you, know, you think of Bitcoin as a fungible token. It can be used as a currency. If Ken has, is going to sell me uh, an apple for $2, I can send him $2 worth of Bitcoin. He doesn't care which Bitcoin I sent him. They're all interchangeable and not necessarily unique like a dollar bill, they might have a serial number associated with them, or you can say each one's a little bit different, but it doesn't matter which one I give to Ken, I'm, he's still gonna give me the app. An NFT is in theory, the opposite of that. Each one is unique and can be identifiable and can be traded as something that is separate and apart from all the other NFTs. Is that 40,000 foot view? Any questions on that? I mean, I, I, I think this is hard for people to grasp because I've, 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 I've said it that way. And maybe it's, I think part of it is I'm not saying it as, as well as I could be. So, I think part of it is so, so, more, so, so what happens, for example, if, if you take a JPEG, right? You, you are an artist and you take an image, a JPEG, how do you, like what happens when you turn it into NFT? What, what does it mean from intellectual property perspective? Like, Sure, so, you know, a JPEG can be copied infinite times, right? So you can have JPEG number one, two, three, they're all, they're all essentially an exact duplicate of each other. And you can embed each one of those into an NFT. And then NFT, uh, I'm not sure embedding is, is, is quite the way it works, but you can upload uh, that JPEG into an NFT and the NFT would encapsulate that JPEG, but also all the other metadata that you could put alongside of it. So metadata meaning uh, a title, a description to go along with it, um, things like uh, royalty rates, um, uh, permissions, uh, codes that are only accessible uh, or data that's only accessible to the owner of the NFT. The NFT can also represent, um, you know, a, 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 a literal contract in the sense that the holder of the NFT is entitled to to own some real property or perhaps even the, the copyright in the JPEG itself. Um, Okay, so we're getting some comments here uh, that that the, the blockchain itself we might need to back up, which I think is is a valid comment. I don't know, Max, if, 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 if we're too basics here, or, or if we should try and 
what, why don't we go what, why don't we go super, super high level basics on we're, we're going to skip bitcoin because it doesn't relate to the nfts directly because it's kind of a standalone um you know fungible coin uh and just talk a little bit about ethereum uh which is the most popular network um you know currently used to to mint and trade nfts well, think of it as, as a distributed database. Uh, let, think of it as an Excel spreadsheet uh, to which everyone in this room has access to, right? So we have about 100 of people and you can pull out the distributed Excel spreadsheet and, and see what, what's, what has been saved on, on, on that spreadsheet. So for example, if, if, uh, if Moish is issuing NFT token on a blockchain and it's, it's minted as part of the ERC20 ledger record on, on the database, Everyone can see this this record, right? So, in case of NFT, if if we create an image, it's it's saved on a ledger, and all of all of you can look it up who is the real owner of it. So, unlike with JPEGs, uh, which have which may have thousands of copies, you would not know who the real owner is. So, by being able to record it on a ledger, accessible in in real time, twenty four seven, you are able to authenticate the uh, the the title to that NFT. Correct, and, and anyone in the world can see that a certain wallet address, right? An Ethereum wallet, and the owner of that wallet is is the owner of record of an NFT, just like you would be able to go into a real life, uh, you know, title office in a real estate office and say, who is the owner of record of that property? Everyone can see that, and it's distributed across the world. Right, and so this is why it's so exciting for for the music industry, for the art industry, for any kind of creative uh, art of work, right? Because if you are a musician and you a DJ and you just produce some really cool piece of, of beats, you can put it on the blockchain and, and thereby saying that I am the owner of these beats. I am the true owner and there can be only one. So think of it as a title, title insurance that can be looked up uh, by anyone in this room. Okay, I think that's a pretty good overview. Um, so Max, why don't you give us a, a quick idea of what agency or agencies regulate NFTs? All right, that's actually a fun part because uh, the NFT marketplaces, uh, participants that buy trade and transmit uh, value, digital currency or NFT, uh, uh, products on these platforms uh, may be subject to uh, maybe subject to the jurisdiction of you you would love but actually US Department of Defense uh, and I will explain why uh, IRS uh, financial crimes enforcement net network commodity futures and trading commission security and exchange commission and, and as well as 49 state uh, regulators uh, that uh, that supervise money transmission uh, activities in those states so the way I see it, it's probably the most complicated and sophisticated product, and in some cases, financial product uh, ever known to the main, main kind, because we have so many different regulators that can potentially come in and regulate it. But the space has been exploding during the past two months, and it's very surprising that we, we haven't uh, heard uh, like a single statement from any of the regulators explaining what's really happening, how they will be regulating it, and what, what their position on the whole industry, right? Uh, just to, to give you a, a example why, for example, I, I think US Department of Defense may be regulating the, uh, this activity. So uh, the Department of Defense issued the National Defense Authorization Act uh, uh, of 2021. It was approved by Congress this January. And as part of this act, uh, there is a new uh, Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2020 that expanded definition of uh, financial institutions that now include dealers in art, right? So we have dealers in art and the act also expanded definition of financial institutions to cover uh, merchants and businesses that facilitate cryptocurrency transactions, right? So it's a very broad statement, but looking at this uh, act from a 10,000 feet view, uh, it, there is an argument to be made that, well, we have a platform, they trade digital art. Uh, the, the act uh, aims to uh, prevent any kind of illicit uh, trading activities uh, within art. So therefore NFT marketplace 
should be subject to the same rules, right? Also, uh, FinCEN came out last year and uh, I think earlier uh, in, in 2020 uh, with a statement that, uh, uh, that any kind of uh, P2P, uh, peer-to-peer uh, marketplaces and, and participants that are exchanging values uh, or digital currency on those P2P networks in fa- effectively become money transmitters, right? So this is extremely confusing. Uh, what, what's happening, and 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 the fact that none of the regulators came out and and, and gave a clear guidance as to what uh, people uh, and and participants and investors should be looking at is really uh, really worries me. So Max, if let's let's try and separate it a little bit, right? If if, if you're a platform that's going to you know, be the brokering and, and, mar- and marketing NFTs. That's one thing. If you're a consumer and you just want to go out and buy an NFT, what, what kind of risk might might be out there for someone like that? Well, I, I can we can only go by by the existing rules, but so far none of the agencies have applied those rules, right? And and the rules are as follows. Uh, for example, FinCEN, right? Uh, there is a, is a guidance that came out from FinCEN saying that any any participant um, on a peer-to-peer marketplace may be subject to uh, money transmitter rules if they conducted for any kind of commercial activity, right? So this, in a way, could make any buyer and seller of NFTs a money transmitter, right? This this is that's crazy. Is that's so it is crazy. So, so we need it some regulatory clarity here. I, absolutely. I, I think like someone needs to come out from either FinCEN and say like, all right, here's the rule. Here's how you do it. Okay. Because on the other hand, they come out with really, mis- I mean, not misleading, but, but scary uh, uh, messages, right? The, I, I just recently read uh, uh, in, in, you know, indictment of Arthur Hayes and, and BitMEX exchange, right? Uh, where they say, well, you guys, you were many transmitters. You had to follow these, these rules. Uh, and you, you haven't, so you're subject to our jurisdiction. So anyway, a lot of a lot of stuff is going on, and we hope that uh, that that regulators will will make it very clear to to the market participants and exchanges what what rules and obligations are participating in this ecosystem. But looks like really early days of cannabis. Uh, right. I think I mean also like the IC, ICO craze right. you know, from, from 2017, yeah. where depending on it, it just it depends on what you're buying and. If you're buying a seventy million dollar one versus a five dollar one, there might be a different risk reward calculus there, uh, right? In terms of the type of activity you're doing. Okay, great. So, sh- should we continue moving on? Uh, Moish, Moish, why don't you you give us a, a, a quick overview of exactly h- how does one create an NFT since you since you have done it yourself? Uh, okay. You so okay. so it yes. So the, there there's there's different ways to do it and. The, the easiest way I would think is, is there's a number of different platforms like Rarible and Mintable that basically create a platform where uh, depending on, usually it's, it's Ethereum, but it doesn't have to be. You would take the you know JPEG, music file, video file, uh, wh- whatever it is that you're gonna upload as the, as the content portion of the NFT, you'll use that platform to upload it. You'll Put a little bit of gas fees or Ethereum in, into that transaction to make it all uh, sync with the Ethereum blockchain, and then you're going to get a token. It's going it's to print basically a token for you that will be your NFT, and you will be uh, the owner of that token. Now, it, it's a little more complicated than that because you need to have a wallet that's going to access this platform in most cases. Um, and, and, and so that's how you would create one as, as, a, as a business owner, as a creator. There, there's other ways, there's different platforms. It, it can get way more complicated, but that, that's, that's pretty simple. Now to buy it, it, it can be even more simple, right? Because there's platforms like NBA Top Shop, Top Shot that allow you to just enter a credit card, you have an account and you just buy it and then you can sell it, right? So it, it's, it's a little bit simpler um, on, on some of these other platforms, but you should look at each platform because each one's a little different and each one has either terms and conditions like NBA Top Shot has really stringent terms and conditions that say you cannot use the NFT for commercial purposes. And some of the platforms just have nothing. It's just up to you to figure out, you know, buy, buyer beware, creator beware, right? So um, as an attorney, it's difficult because p- people are asking, well, what, what is an NFT and what rights do I have and what can I do with it? And 
but it, it each NFT is going to be different. Each platform is going to be different. Each each the content of each NFT could be different. So there's not going to be a one size fits all answer for every use case. But so how do you make sense of it, Moish? If, if you have an artist who wants to issue uh, NFT token for his digital art, like how do you make sense of all these rules that, that, that one has to follow? Uh, like how many copies can we issue? Like what, what uh, features can we assign to, to this NFT products? How can we trade them? Do we need to have any built-in KYC email uh, checks? Any, any thoughts on this? I, I think it's all. I think it's all just so new that they're all still open questions. Um, the, the the market, both, both like is is just still developing, um, and and the input. I think we're in the first or second inning of this thing. So what's going to happen? What's going to you know? Obviously on the regulatory side, we're going to need some gaps to be filled uh, in the marketplace in terms of you know. There's it sounds like there's basically a different platform that allows you to mint NFTs. That's opening every day. Each of them are different, um, and and there's it it. In terms of what you can do as a as an, an owner of IP, um, as a creator, as as a business that that is trying to get involved in this, is you know just like you would in any new uh, context where you're going to go into a licensing arrangement or something like that, right? You need to do diligence on yourself. You need to know what you own. If you're just a single artist at home and you want to do something with your right. own copyright that you own, I think it's pretty easy to sit there and experiment and start doing things and. You know, there, there's risk, but the risk might be lower because you, you know what you're you're basically uploading and what you're submitting and what you're going to do with it. But if you're a business and you have employees um, and, and you, you don't have the right permissions in place or you're a licensee or licensor and you're using someone else's work or you're, um, you know, some, something along those lines, you're working with clients, you're an agent for someone, you're an attorney for someone, you're going to need to figure out what the rights are and what you can and can't do and what restrictions might apply. But restrict, okay, but uh, as, as an artist issuing a piece of art, this could be very, very confusing. So uh, as an example, uh, if you go on any of NFT platform, you 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 can digitize your uh, a piece of art, uh, issue, uh, let's say 150 NFT tokens uh, that will be representing interest in that art. You will be assigning some interest, like, all right, royalty, 10%. Uh, you know, resale ten percent, and and the platforms actually provide you with like fulfilled you know options that what you can do, right? So, and, and then you're an artist, you're promoting this product, you have some celebrity backing you, they actively advertising your your NFT tokens on on, on Twitter with three million followers, right? So, uh, but inadvertently, an artist could be creating an investment contract, right? He went zero 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 on knowledge with in, in regards to the uh, securities regulations just go on a platform platform allows you to mint 100 tokens assign different financial features and without knowing you just sold unregistered securities and you let your buyers trade them on secondary exchanges right kind of the same uh, framework that we already went to, uh, through in 2017 2018 where projects were selling uh, utility tokens uh, claiming that they were not securities there were multiple exchanges that said yes that's a great product. It's not a security. Let's trade them. Uh, you know how the story ended, right? Do you see kind of yeah, the parallel? I mean, Red Ripple's still in the news today, right? So, um, yeah, it, it's it's certainly a risk. I think the more you're getting towards the idea that, I mean, you, you're you're getting to the point of utility, right? So, and and I think it's also a sense of, you know, is there any sort of promotion of the of the NFT as an investment vehicle, right? You are, I am selling this to you because it's a good investment and it will appreciate and you will make money. That, that sounds like, like an investment in security issue. If this is a collectible, I want to engage my audience. I'm, a, I'm an artist and I'm just right. selling you a, a, a collectible that, that allows you to, to, to engage an artist that you like. Uh, right. That might be going away from that utility. So I, I don't think there's any clear guidance of that, but I think you can say uh, there, there's, there's some things that are, that are much more uh, have utility and, and perhaps in the future there's going to be a lot more uh, development in terms of what NFTs can do and how they can be repackaged and uh, right. and used for things like royalty tracking and, and, and whatever we're talking about there, right? But I think there's there's ultimately like on, on the other side, just like this is just a collectible. I'm just buying it for fun. Uh, there's no expectation of uh, it's going to itself make me money or generate some sort of cash flow. It's just 
uh, I'm, I'm buying it as a collector's item, as a as a way to engage with uh, you know something I'm a fan of. Right, but when when you are let's say uh, a creator of that NFT and and you're selling it to someone else, uh, what kind of representations are you making? That yes, this is a product. This is not a security. Like, how do you navigate those risks? So yeah, I, 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 I yeah. So I'm curious, I, I I'm curious think, what you think. I mean, it, it's it's an so, I mean, can, can you just in the in the content of the NFT itself, like put disclaimers? Is that is that going to be good enough? Right. And, no, I, I because even if you if it's a security unregistered, the fact that you uh, have a disclaimer it doesn't help you much. It's, it's a strict liability. So what needs to happen? Securities and Exchange Commission needs to come out, come out, and with some guidance for the market participants, just to level level the uh, understanding of what's happening. We won't necessarily hold our breath, but the alternative would be for Congress to step up and pass a law and actually tell us what the uh, <laughs> how to treat these things. And there is currently legislation pending uh, that would that would deal with some of the regulatory concerns. But in, in the interim, we are basically waiting for the regulators to wake up and uh, and start issuing guidance here to to help them. I'll, develop. Right. I'll give you another example. Uh, so the 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 existing uh, money transmitter rules. So technically, a platform if if it's uh, uh, the way the, the law is written right now, following uh, FinCEN's uh, guidance of, of 2019 and 2020. So each marketplace could be potentially looked as a, as a money uh, service business, right? Subject to federal and state money transmitters rules. But the, these rules were written back in the 70s and 80s, right? So it's, it's an exploding field. So even if a company wants to stay compliant and, and get all these money transmittal rules, uh, uh, licenses in all states, you're probably looking today uh, at at least nine to 20 months to get those licenses. And a, a startup would need to have a budget of at least a million dollars to even start it, right? That's a lot of time for, for the DeFi and, and cryptocurrency uh, industry, right? So on the, on the one hand, there are startups that they want to comply with these rules, but they're just so burdensome that if, if they start complying, they will be completely out of this business by the time they get it. So... But I, I think that's what you're already seeing and, and you're seeing it. And I mean, it, just like, you know, Coinbase is trying to do all the right things to get all the licenses they need so they can go public and, and be the, the US-based KYC, you know, validated. There's, there's all sorts of offshore exchanges that people are able to access whether they're located in the US or not. So I think and with NFTs, it, we're going to see the same thing where there's going to be platforms which are going to try and be compliant and try and make the best user experience and try and minimize risk for users and people that engage with that platform. And there's going to be platforms uh, that are not going to do that, that are just going to be international, distributed, maybe not even have a nationality associated with it, um, which are going to make themselves available with, with to, to do whatever you want. So, I mean, I, I think it's a good question of, you know, what the regulations are and, and who, how are you complying with it and how are you minimizing risk and you should be trying to do those things. But I think we also have to acknowledge the reality that uh, it's people are, the, the cat's out of the bag, right? People are doing it and they're going to continue doing it whether or not um, there's regulatory guidance and whether or not uh, there's potential legal, I mean, sure, the U.S. can go after them, but we're talking about, you know, ripple, ripples four years later, right? So we're going to have four years of a of a, a runway of people are going to go out and do that, and and we're not going to get you know SEC action until for you know I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but you know the, the timelines here with this thing exploding and being front page news now within a month, and and we're talking about regulatory guidance of you know one to four year timelines. It it, it just seems like if if you're in this space now and you want to start doing stuff in the space and monetizing the space, you need to minimize risk and 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 pick a path and and do it in the way that you think is going to be best for your business i, I mean just a reality because people are going to do it whether or not they, they talk to attorneys but there is so much to digest like what do you do as a retail as a retail buyer of this i mean it's it's very confusing you just buy it you don't buy it you take a risk i mean i i don't know yeah i don't know either <laughs> so that's what makes it exciting Yep. It's definitely, it's, it's evolving as we're watching here. Um, I want to just sh shift the conversation slightly um, and, and, and start looking at the intellectual property um, and, and royalty issues uh, related to NFTs. Um, so let's, let's just start with, you know, general overview of the, the legal implications of revenue and royalty sharing, 
um, in, in the context of, you know, we can choose art as a, uh, as an example here. Yeah, I, I, Ken, we've been talking about this. I, I think the, the revenue royalty sharing licensing aspect of NFTs might, might be the most exciting thing for, for intellectual property holders. The idea that, you know, if you're an artist, you can, you can give someone, or you can make the right to, uh, create, you know, an NFT with your work and then every future sale of that. So I, I sell my art to Ken, I get, I get hundred percent of that, right? Minus platform fees, uh, whatever Ken pays for my art. Ken now sells it to Max. I, the artist still get a portion of that resale. Max sells it to some, uh, to some fourth person. I, the artist still get royalty of that. So that, that I think is incredibly powerful and something that really hasn't existed in a, in a way that can be reasonably governed by, I mean, this is all governed by the blockchain, right? So Ken can't sell it to someone else and avoid paying me the royalty. It's encoded into the existence of the NFT. So there's no way to avoid it. So if you're someone who's, you know, existing in like the traditional licensing royalty kind of world and you know, well, I'm, I'm putting so much time and effort into creating a license agreement, making sure that the, the royalty provisions are, are drafted correctly, making sure that I'm auditing my, uh, my licensee or my manufacturer or my distributors to make sure that I'm getting paid every cent I'm supposed to be paid, um, you know, suing them to, uh, what if all of that could just be encoded into uh, a token and, and you can just, just do it that way? I mean, wouldn't that be amazing? I mean, it's just, so, so that part is what, what gets me exciting. And I know people are working on these kinds of things. And I think some of the technological things are, are being built underneath it that'll make it more seamless and possible. But I, I think- Moish, I, yeah. but then how do we protect the retail investors who are buying them? I, I, I listened yesterday to a very interesting podcast uh, hosted by Gary Vaynerchuk. And he said, look, 95% of all these NFTs, they'll, they'll, they'll be next to nothing. Because we don't need so many collectible baseball cards. We don't need so many, uh, you know, basketball NFT cards. Like not all, not all of the cards that are sell, sold today for twenty thousand dollars would be twenty thousand dollars. And so the question is, people that are buying them, are, are they collectors or are they speculators? And because if they see it as an investment, then then shouldn't there be some kind of proper disclosures made by an artist? Why is he raising funds? On what terms? Like. How do we protect investors here is, is, is also a very important question. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, I think some of it is you know, th something that's already happening in society. Like if, if there's a gamification and a, and a collector kind of mindset of like, you know, sneakers are bought and resold now, right? Um, it, it, so it's, it's, it's something that people are doing in, in, the, in that context already, right? So yeah, I, I don't know. What, what do you think, Max? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think what we can we can say on that well you're raising an example with an artist that that needs to uh to raise uh funds for 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 creating his new album right but so on the one hand we have an artist who wants to raise funds but on the other hand we have retail investors that that wants to buy it and they're buying it hoping to uh to make to make some money of it right so today there are regulated mechanisms for for small businesses and as you said, artists to raise funds. They can do regulation CF. It's relatively an expensive option. It's state compliant. No? Well, how do you compare that to uh, to NFT world and fundraising and for NFTs? Yeah, and, and I think it gets back to that sliding scale, right? Of, of, of what's the utility of, of, of the token? I mean, like there's the two comments here. You know, on, on the one hand, you can fully tokenize an, a, a, a company structure. You can create a company that is completely autonomously governed by utility tokens. Uh, on the other hand, you have something like StockX where it's just a marketplace where you're buying and selling shoes, right? So, so th those are those are like two, I think, very different ends of a spectrum. But and how I do think, you, uh, wait, wait, how do you tokenize a company? Uh, like it's still, if you're tokenizing a company, it, you're selling securities, just digital right. securities. No, exactly. But it's, it's, a securities selling, it's a securities offering. So you make uh, a lot of material representations to your investors. Why are you raising Well, you're supposed to. You're supposed to like what's what's going to be your marketing budget, your development, so people know that like okay, and they can make an educated decision whether or not this is a sound investment. But when you have a musician who's raising, let's say, two hundred fifty thousand dollars to uh to 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 create an album, how how do you know on, on how will he be spending that money? Like if 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 that 
if that NFT token goes to zero, and as Gary Gary, Gary V said, ninety five percent will do. Wouldn't uh, you be up, Wouldn't you be upset as as an investor that you just lost a lot of money? Uh, absolutely, and and that's I mean that that's why you know artists are thinking about these things and trying to mitigate risk. And I, I think it's it's very important how they package these things together, what sort right. of representations they're making. Um, you know, and and yeah, if I'm an if I'm an investor in this area, I would absolutely I mean, just like. Bitcoin went down 90%, right? It, it, it's, it's something people are like, oh, well, now it's an all-time high. But there's a chance that all this is just going to go to zero for, you know, two to three years. And if you're not, or, or longer forever, right? Or it could, you know, so, so there, there's no way to tell. But absolutely, if you're trying to create this thing, you're trying to market it as an investment, you should keep in mind the, those ideas that it could all go to zero and you're going to have, you know, thousands of people right. really angry at you that know where right. you live that are going to go after you, right? Gonna sue you for for that part, right? Super exciting area, but I, it's it's a, it's about finding the right balance, right? Where where artists and and musicians can use this as a as a tool to fundraise. Or maybe I mean fundraise. I'm not sure if it's the right word to use, but uh, and also protection of of uh, retail uh, in this uh, industry. Yeah. Yeah. So I agree. How about the ways that the 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 different terms and conditions, uh, you know, will, will affect the creation of the NFT and exactly what is being uh, transferred. Like how, how important is platform selection um, if someone's considering tokenizing one of their artworks or, or other copyrighted or, or other uh, property, intellectual property? Max, you want to take this one? Well, I, I can comment uh, on I'm using the platforms from uh, securities regulations perspective, and but I think uh, you uh, you'll be you'll do a better uh, explanation on intellectual property since this is your forte. Yeah, so I, I think in terms of you know d definitely as an as an IP owner, you you want to be making sure that the platform that you're going to be using is going to be consistent with how you're you're planning to offer your token. Um, you know, it, it, and, and I think a lot of the platforms don't have anything. So, and, and I think even those are some of the more popular platforms right now, just in terms of there's, there's no terms and conditions. You just connect the wallet by yourself. So is that consistent with how you want to sell it? It, it, it might be just that you, you don't care. You're just going to sell it. And you're going to mint the NFT and you're going to sell it and you're just going to take that risk. Um, it, it may be more appropriate to, to find someone that you can partner with that is going to uh, create some guide rails and, and protect you and, and you know, maybe do some KYC type thing. So, so you, you're, you're not concerned, like it, that, that being that the platform itself is gonna make sure that the buyers and sellers in the marketplace are not terrorists, right? So you know, things, things like that, right? So really basic stuff that you, you would hope that when you go to an art auction and you sell your stuff that Christie's is going to um, make sure that that it's sold in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that's going to be appropriate for your art and your artwork um, and, and not just kind of a free for all. Um, so I, I, I think it, it, the conversation about what a platform should look like, what they should do is, is just starting because I think the, the idea of what the intellectual property um, implications here is so new that some of the platforms aren't really thinking about it and making those guide rails. But I think as we kind of get a more developed ecosystem, you're going to see that. Um, I've already seen platforms that are allowing you to choose whether or not to sell your copyright, assign your copyright along with the purchase of an NFT, things like that. Um, I know there's a number of questions about um, the intellectual property rights um, that, that may be implicated in that, so we can get to that too. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll we'll start touching on those in a moment. Just before we leave the topic of the platforms, Max, do you have anything to say about the on, on the regulatory side with respect to the platforms and, and what role they fill and or or how those roles may differ based on the type of uh, NFT that they're that they're permitting to be minted, whether that's just a pure, like pure collectible NFTs versus un ownership of underlying intellectual property, obviously versus underlying ownership of a, of a business. Does that change your analysis at all? Right, so uh, I, there are three uh, levels of risks here. Uh, the first one is intellectual property. Just understand what, what rights you get uh, when you purchase an NFT, right? The second risk is, is whether or not you are uh, you know, 
participating in in mincing of uh, of securities, right? And this risk should not be overlooked. And unfortunately, this is something that a platform will never advise you on, right? Uh, they will just provide a technical capability to issue as many tokens as you as you want, and then assign different uh, you know financial uh, uh, features to that. Uh, so this may uh, this this is what seems to me a little risky, right? So uh, and an artist should be uh, uh, cautious with doing it, and, and probably you know look at it, each product individually just to understand if if somehow this can and land them in, in the lala land of, of securities regulations uh, where they probably don't want to be. Uh, uh, and the third risk is uh, is uh, KYC and AML. Uh, and I, we spoke today with Moish and I said, Moish, you know, it's interesting. Even in 2017 and 2018, there were tons of ICO projects based in the US and Asia. And even those projects had, like all of them, they had KYC and AML checks. Right, they were small budget projects, and they were following it. So why are we not seeing this right now? And with NFTs, like some of these platforms are worth tons and tons of money, right? So either they perceive this as not to be a risk, or they see it as a risk that they comfortable ignoring. I don't know. There is not a single sort of statement lately on NFTs from the regulators. So we can only, I guess, guess. What, what's gonna happen after. Uh, but certainly uh, there is a lot of gray area for, for people that are participating in this marketplace. Um, so it's, it's a business decision, decision for a client or a platform whether or not they want to participate in it. Our job as lawyers is to outline and map out potential liabilities uh, that a client is looking at, and, and then they will be deciding uh, as part of a business decision whether or not they're willing to uh, to take on all those risks and, and make a lot of money and then later deal with this. Yep. So, um, Moish, what, what would you see as the, the the mechanism that people should use? This is uh, part of the part of the questions that are that are coming in here um, that that might be, I think, at the top of a lot of people's minds. Uh, what mechanism might be used and, and what challenges might be presented if, let's say, some, some third party who is not the original artist obtains, let's say, a JPEG of the artwork and then mints their own NFT of that artwork and uploads it to one of these platforms? Yeah, that, that's a, it's a great question. And, and it's a, I mean, the, the big question here is, you know, I, I think authenticity, right? So it's, before you even get to that question is, how do you know if an NFT is, the the real one, right? So if uh, Jack Dorsey takes his tweet and tweets about it and says, I, I made an NFT, well, it's pretty obvious, right? Because Jack Dorsey is the owner of Twitter. He's not verified on Twitter. You know that when his official Twitter profile says, here's my NFT, um, that, that probably links to him, right? Um, but I think when you get to the idea that, well, anyone can take any image and upload it as part of an NFT, just like, you know, anyone can take a file and share it via BitTorrent, right? Um, that that as, as an IP owner, there's there's huge potential liability for, you know, well, do I have to now monitor this NFT market and make sure no one's stealing my work? Um, if someone does steal my work, uh, what do I need to do? Um, you know, is, is there any sort of, it, it, what, what can I do, right? Because you're talking about things that are now uh, on the blockchain, uh, to some extent, irreversibly. Um, uh, you know, some of the NFTs, it, you know, it, it, there's there's this concept of, well, the NFT is only linking to an underlying image, so the underlying image, it, in theory, could be removed from wherever it's hosted, right? I, I think that's a, a a temporary problem. I think I think that, that ultimately everything we're talking about is going to be distributed, internationalized, and and very difficult to take down unless you know who created it and you know that they have assets and you know where those assets are located, it's gonna be hard to go and sue them and force them to do something or to pay you money. Um, it, it, or even if you have all those things, you know where they're located, you, you, you know that they have assets. It may not be economically feasible to uh, start a copyright infringement lawsuit because that takes time and money. And uh, 
so so it, all all these things are are I think existing problems that we've seen uh, in in like you know BitTorrent issues, um, you know file sharing. I, I think it's the same problem. It's just a uh, it, it's 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 a new context. I see a comment here. Yeah, the IPFS. Yep, exactly. Like so so some of the platforms use a, um, a decentralized hosting of the files. Some of them don't like, you know, so it's, it's it again, it gets back to like, well, what are you buying? What, what does that mean? What does the NFT embody? Um, everyone's different. And so same thing, it, it, when, you, when you get to copyright usage, trademark usage, enforcement of those, of, uh, of, you know, every circumstance is gonna be a little different because every NFT is gonna be a little different and how you approach uh, either creating it or shutting it down is gonna be a little different. Are there any corollaries that have existed where where a you know basically a brand new technology comes out and there's a question about what rights different parties have to to use the underlying intellectual property in in this new way, um, like with an ordinary licensing agreement? Yeah, this is the example. I uh, you know I, I I used to work in the music industry and I was uh, this was like in the mid two thousands and. The, the hot thing then was was ringtones, right? So if you're a record label and you have a, a, a contract with a musician that says, well, you can print, you can, you can sell their records, right? That you're limited to a license to do that limited scope, right? Well, now I want to sell ringtones. Does that, does that count? So now I need to look at the license screen. I need to see, well, what's the language? How does that match up with my license grant? Am I authorized to do the thing that I want to do? So here it's, I mean, there's going to be lots of rights holders that, I mean, maybe they have something in the in the contract. I mean, something typical would be like, you know, any any new media hereafter devised, right? Something like that. Um, may, may, is this is this a new media? I probably. I mean, I don't know. I guess we'll see, right? There's going to be litigation, things like that. I don't want to guess one way or the other without looking at contractual language. But I think it's something that everyone that, that has, you know, a license agreement with some other person that wants to go uh, mint an NFT should look at the language of their license agreement. And make sure that they have the permission to do what they're planning to do. But Moise, but that layer is missing right now. If there are no license agreements, uh, if you're buying NFT token on one of those platforms, what what rights do you get? Is there anything attached to the to the sale, like accompanying uh, uh, terms of sale? Like what what are you getting today in exchange for? Yeah, so I, I think it's 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 a different question for if you're the the artist or the licensee and you're creating it versus right. if you're the consumer on the platform and you're purchasing it. And I, I think it, it doesn't necessarily need to link that the the purchaser is going to tie to the rights that the creator is getting. So the creator can have one set of rights and then they're only giving the purchaser some very narrow subset of that rights. Wait, like, so for but, example, you, yeah. But, but who, how do I know what rights uh, the creator has? If I'm the purchaser, like, what am I getting today? If, if I purchase uh, NFT token for $10,000, it's an expensive purchase, right? So am I buying a cat in the bag without knowing what the rights are? Yeah, you may, you may not, right? It gets back to that authenticity issue. Who's, who's issuing, issuing it? How do you know that they're issuing it? Are they the real famous recording artist or is it uh, a, a phony, right? Um, I think there's ways that um, yeah. the people that are the, the prominent celebrities can make that clear. Um, but I, I think there's also, uh, I, I think the, the difficulty here is how, how do we get that information to be included as part of the sale? So you're 100% sure that what you're buying is a real thing. And then when it's resold, you know, it, that, that it all ties back up to the original authentic creator. Um, I think that's a really difficult problem. And, and I don't know if anyone has necessarily solved it yet. Yeah, if they right. have, I'd, love to, I'd love to learn more about it. Right now, I mean, the consumers are basically stuck with whatever the terms and conditions said when the creator of the NFT uploaded it or, or, or minted it, um, so to speak, right? But then that, that gets back to the exact issue that Moish said, which is how do you know that the person that minted that NFT is actually the genuine creator? Um, yeah. I mean, look, the, the platform that ultimately solves that problem is going to have a very nice business on its hands because that, that is currently... Uh, a huge issue. There have been questions here about what happens if someone takes the same image and just creates an NFT on a different blockchain, um, right? Because there's the Ethereum blockchain, there, there's the, the Dapper Labs blockchain, the, the Binance blockchain, there's all different um, potential ways that these tokens can be 
um, created and displayed and, and, and used. Um, but actually, uh, in, in this general vein, Max, um, are, does any of your analysis change on the regulatory side if there is a, a public blockchain versus a private permission blockchain like with NBA Top Shot? Well, it's it's uh, the NBA Top Shot. It's uh, more of a restricted uh, sale, and probably uh, I, I like this approach better, given the regulatory uncertainty. Right, so they they vet who the buyers are. Uh, they do the basic KYC ML checks. There are restrictions on, on resale of NFTs. Uh, you you can't find you can't find like a Top Shot NFT. Uh, card uh, being sold or traded on on open sea uh, platforms so I, I like this approach uh, as opposed to some other projects that are a little bit more wild right and and potentially can get uh, can get unnecessary uh, uh, questioning from some of the regulators and and thereby exposing the uh, investors who participated uh, in this offering to the risk of their NFTs going to zero, so. Uh, and, and Moish, do you see a, a, an intellectual property value in, in the private blockchains, you know, as a, from, a, from a licensing and, and control perspective? Yeah, from, I mean, I, I think definitely the, the concept of, you know, I, I know there's, there's bigger enterprises that are working on using the blockchain to, um, you know, track products, make sure they're authentic. So, right, so you're talking about physical products, right? If, if you have a, a head of lettuce that's sourced from Mexico and you can track, you know, every step of the production line that, it, that it's gone on and until it arrives at the grocery store, well, if you can do that for a physical object, you can do that for, for digital objects too, right? So you can, you can theoretically, you can use a, a blockchain to track all these things. Uh, there, there can be all sorts of, uh, something developed on top of it, that if you're a creator and you have 20 people contributing to a project, you can track their contributions into the underlying work and then allocate royalties back, you know, so something like that, right? Um, or, so so I, I think it's really an open world that, that the, the blockchain is now gonna allow people and now in the creative industry, I, I think some of this stuff has been happening before the NFT kind of this, this, last, this past month. I think this is just kind of shining a spotlight on it and, illuminating some of the potential use cases um, that could be really exciting, um, you know, that, that may be a few years down the road. What do you, so the, what do you think about the Dapper uh, the Labs, the, uh, the company that uh, is behind CryptoKitties, right? The, uh, the, the, the market cap of, of a company, it's $2 billion. They recently closed the $250 million raise. It's a $2 billion company <laughs> selling CryptoKitties. Well, they they did NBA Top Shot too, which I I mean right Top Shot, and and they had they had their own token right the Flow token. I don't know if that if that relates to their market cap or not, but uh, the, flow, the Flow blockchain, yeah, yeah. So so what do you guys think is is this is kind of our our, our open end question as we get to the to the tail end of the hour here? You know, what do you guys think is next for? NFTs, and uh, you know, we can we can let you uh, get started here, Max, from a from a regulatory perspective. You know, who do you think the the first actor is going to be, or should be, um, or or what do you think is next? And and then Moish, the the same question uh, from an intellectual property perspective. Well, if if looking at this uh, from a perspective of NFT platform, and we do get. Uh, we work with advice companies and, and clients who are considering launching an NFT platform or a DeFi application around NFTs. And because this is a gray, gray area, I think it's, it's important to uh, speak to a regulator, at least on an anonymous basis and understand what kind of feedback you can get from it, from that. Right. Because oftentimes, uh, it's, it's my understanding that regulators don't fully understand how to regulate these products, right? So if you are a business and you are launching this NFT platform, it's good to have like something in, in writing from the regulator that, yeah, they are familiar with this project. We're trying to, to stay compliant with all regulations, but the, the nature of these rules is very, very unclear. So for us, it's extremely difficult to understand what, what you want from us, right? 
So it's important to start initiating this kind of conversations with regulators. And, uh, and I, I believe that's probably what other top platforms are doing right now because, uh, because there are questions relating to their status as money transmitters under the FinSign regulations and state regulations. So there, there's tons of uh, disagreement on the federal and state level how these platforms should be regulated. For example, uh, I've seen recently uh, a no action letter issued uh, from the state of California in which uh, the California Department of Financial Services determined that P2P platforms are not subject to money transmitter regulations, right? While other states regulate it. So, and the federal government regulates it. So we, we need to have some initial discussions uh, with regulators to make sure that they'll be not going after the project after the launch. Uh, so that's my take on, on the platforms. And, and of course, uh, investors and, and, and people that want to participate in this exciting market, uh, as, as they say, buyer beware. So do, do your due diligence, understand who the seller is, what, what rights you're getting and, and how your rights will be protected after you purchase uh, your NFT. Also, uh, very important to do an analysis, at least an initial one to understand whether these products could be potentially viewed uh, as unregistered securities and if, if they are then you you will not be able to resell them without violating securities regulations so once again very exciting marketplace there are amazing projects out there uh but due diligence is is key here all right yeah i like all those things i'm, I'm just uh, yeah again buyer beware um you know and and minter beware you know it, if you're thinking about putting your intellectual property into one of these, if you're thinking about doing a license agreement, um, just be mindful and careful about what you're doing and who you're doing it with and what platform you're using and, and how you're, you know, maybe experiment a little bit with something that's not uh, of high value to you so you understand how it all works and, and, and kind of build up to that or work with someone that um, has that experience, right? Um, but I, I think it's just really exciting. and. Um, I'm excited to be part of it and to work with people that, that are doing this because I, I think, it, we're, we're, again, we're, ju we're just at the beginning of this. And I think the things that are going to be developed and that are going to start happening are going to be really exciting. Um, so, I mean, I, I think we're, we're right here at the end of the hour. Um, I think it'd be good. I, I don't know, Max, if we were scheduled to one o'clock, if you want to try and stick around and answer a few questions and sure. uh, up to you. Uh, we can open up. Ken, I don't know if there's any questions you yeah, saw but, in the Q&A that you wanted. We have, we have a lot of questions. I think the, the, the volume and some of the specificity is such that it, it's going to be difficult for us to address. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll try to call out a couple of more general questions with, with, a, with a broader applicability. Um, we've already done that to a certain extent, but what I'll encourage people to do is to email um, info at frblaw.com if you have specific questions that you haven't presented here, and we'll loop in uh, Max to that conversation and, and Max and Moish can comment on your, your individual um, questions. Uh, anyone who has posted a question that has not yet been answered, um, I have those tracked and, and copied to the side. So as long as you registered with your preferred email address and the name that you are using on Zoom, um, we will contact you directly with answers to, to your questions. Um, and of course, if anyone wants to set up um, you know, any kind of follow up more, more lengthy conversations. Um, I think Max and Moish would be happy to, to do that um, from here. So I think that ends our, our, our real, our hour of content. Um, but let's, let's look at a couple of these more general um, questions just to, to kind of get a, uh, a quick overview. So let's say that if you sell the, the proverbial trading card um, in NFT format, is there anything binding you uh, to or, or else preventing you from also selling the, the physical or underlying asset? Is there anything preventing you from doing that? I, I don't think so. I think you can be as creative as you want in terms of linking, you know, the NFT to, to physical assets in the world. Um, I think you can, uh, you know, I, I think it, it gets to the question of, of trust and, and, and authenticity of, of what are you offering? If you're a celebrity and you say, hey, I'm gonna give you free concert tickets if you buy my NFT alongside that, um, I think people are probably gonna trust that you're gonna do that and are gonna buy it with an expectation that that's actually gonna be the case um, or that you know that 
physical artwork or something is going to go along with it. And if you're someone that's credible and verifiable and you're making that offering and people are going to trust that and, and you don't do that, then um, I, I would expect that, that they would be angry about that. And with with respect to the to the perpetual um, royalties or the potential perpetual royalties when the NFT is minted, is, is the continuing payment of those um, subject to like the the oversight of the platform that they're minted on, or is that just baked into the actual NFT asset itself? It it might depend on what. So if it's just an open like if they open Ethereum blockchain, I, I, I think it's just baked into it and there may not be a way to stop it. Um, if it's more of a, a permissioned private blockchain, uh, there, there might be. So it, it, it might just depend on where it's located and who has control over the blockchain. But also it's custom, it's, it's a contract. So it can be created in, in many different shapes and forms, right? So it, it depends what the terms of the uh, platform are are they participating as uh, in, in future resales? But it's 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 very flexible, right? Like to to have these functions built in into a smart contract, whether or not. Yeah, but, but I think I think right now it's like if if there's a royalty, right? The, the, it's say it's, there's a ten percent royalty. So it's just a, it's just a contract of if if the product is sold, ten percent goes. If the NFT is sold, ten percent goes to creative NFT. And there's no like, but if something else happens, then I think right now it's pretty, like, I think all that could be built into it. Right. It's it just, it just a function. So you, you connect your wallet to a smart contract. So every time the buyer, uh, you know, shifts that, that asset on, on the blockchain, the, uh, the payment is automatically triggered and, and deposited to your wallet. So, so the, in theory, though, more, more complicated kind of follow up functions could be encoded that. If, if something right. else happens, then something different than, you know, than that. By the way, another interesting topic. How do you, uh, like, how do you custody these assets? If you buy, like, a very expensive piece of art, like a million-dollar NFT painting, right? How do you custody it? What about insurance? What if it gets stolen, right? <laughs> another, uh, another thing to uh, carefully analyze. Like, are there any uh, reputable NFT custodians? Uh, are there question. any... Uh, are there any insurance companies that can underwrite these products in case of some loss or theft? Or even if, if you want to put it in, a, like, let's say you're transferring it to your other wallet and then, and then you have to pay a 10% royalty to do that. Right. 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 So, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I think, I think all those things are, are good questions. Let's just say that I wouldn't want to own the insurance company that's underwriting that risk. <laughs> one, one wrong digit as you're sending things and, uh, and suddenly it's gone. That's, that's an interesting question too, actually. So, so let's, let's say that you're an artist and, and you mint an NFT and then you want to, uh, you want to destroy it or you want to, uh, you, you want to um, remove it from the, from the blockchain. Is it possible for you to do that? Um, you know, let, let's say even, even pre-sale or is it permanently part of the, of the ledger? Well, you can burn it, but this is something that has to be uh, disclosed up front to your to your buyers, right? Because, I mean, this this was the the formula in back in 2018, 2019, where when companies started experimenting with digitizing uh, like preferred shares, you know, or OP interests. So there was a built-in function in, in the offering documents that a company can at any time uh, recall the tokens, burn them, and issue new ones, right? But this is something that had to be disclosed to the buyers. So I think here it's the same analysis. If, if you are an artist, you sold them, you can't just burn it and, and not letting anyone know. I would be very upset to find out that my collectible card has been burned because uh, the artist uh, didn't feel like having them out there anymore. But I, I think larger brands are going to approach that a little bit differently. Like I, I think the analogy I would say is, you know, when, when Amazon sells a physical book to you, you own that physical book. When they sell an ebook to you, you own a license to view that book on your Kindle, right? So, and then Amazon can say, uh, I terminate your license, I'm removing your right to view that book from your Kindle. So I think can that they? same concept here is, is going to apply where more larger, more sophisticated brands that are going to be able to, or platforms that are going to be able to encode these, you know, kind of rights management ideas into uh, whatever they're doing might be able to do that in, in a way that, that you know, like, like you just said, right, the, we, can, we can burn the tokens that, that you've received already. 
Right, but they, they still have to follow uh, the terms of use. Or if you read the uh, CryptoKitties terms of use, it's very specific what you can and cannot do with, with the CryptoKitties. So if, if, if the company finds you in violation of these terms of policy, maybe there is a mechanism for them to take it back, right? Or burn it. But it has to be part of the contractual uh, understanding between the parties. Right, but as a, as a consumer using these platforms, you, you might not have that option right now. But I, I would expect that it would be a more sophisticated um, as, as time goes on in terms of making those just easy to use as, as part of something you would be doing in like a, a normal kind of minting. I don't know. Um, what do you think about, for, the, for those platforms that do not really have expressed terms and conditions, um, Moish, do you have any particular opinion on um, what kind of implied license, if any, is being granted by just the, the, the very minting of an NFT without any, any underlying terms and conditions? Yeah, I mean, if, if I'm buying it, I would just presume that I have the right to own the NFT and to, you know, view the NFT, but not necessarily make commercial use of it. Um, I, I guess it depends on what, what they're planning to do with it. <laughs> yeah, so I think that this, for, for, those, for those who are joining us who, who are artists or represent artists um, or, or IP holders, you know, I think that the, one of the critical elements to consider from both the regulatory perspective and the IP perspective is, is you know, platform selection and, and making sure that, that you know, things are being done in a, in a clear way and you're not just you know, willy-nilly jumping into the NFT craze without understanding um, what kind of a license that you're, that you're granting. Yeah, and I see a lot of questions about like fair use. And I think, I think that gets to that point, which is you know, if, if, I, if I now have it, um, you know, what, what sort of reasonable things can I do with, with the NFT um, that, that are, that are going to be a, a fair use, right? Or if I'm creating it using someone else's artwork, but I'm transforming that artwork, it is, is the transformation I'm making sufficient to qualify as a fair use? Um, I don't think we know. Fair, yeah. fair, 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 fair use is like already crazy, even with really established kind of use cases. Um, it's still, you know, for the most part, something that you, you, you need like really complex, like factual analysis to convince a court <laughs> that it is a fair use, right? That, that, so like, you can't just assume that you have a fair use, even for pretty similar um, kind of normal transactions. So when you start getting to like, what sorts of things are fair use with an F NFT, um, you know, I, I, it's gonna be really factual sensitive. Absolutely. All right. So in terms of general questions, I think that's that's really uh, a good place to leave it. I'll, I'll again uh, say anyone that wants to, to reach out with separate questions or feels their question wasn't addressed. Um, there are a few of you who asked very, very specific questions. Um, those I think are best addressed uh, via email and, and separately. But otherwise, um, again, it's info at frblaw.com. And we'll loop Max into those conversations and uh, and be happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Max, do you want to share your email? And um, and then I think we'll also send a follow-up email to everyone mm -hmm. that attended with our contact, each of our contact information. Yeah, sure. My, my email is info at dillendorf.com. Okay. Thank you. And um, yeah, and then, uh, if anyone wants a recording of this webinar um, or anything like that, just email uh, info at frblaw.com. It's all been recorded. It'll be available in the cloud. Um, and that's it. Thank you, everyone for attending. Uh, it, I, I know NFTs are, are complicated and new. Hopefully we were to, able to shed some light on what they are to, to, to you guys. And if you have any more particular questions, feel free to reach out to us. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Moish. Thanks, Max. Bye.